So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, September the 29th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 226. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. I'm really glad that you're here, no matter how you found me. Hopefully somebody recommended it, or maybe just searching around trying to learn more about bees. We have a perfect day outside today. You might be wondering, how perfect is it? Well, 69.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That rounds out to about 21 Celsius, and but that's sunny, so it's even warmer than that. And uh, winds are low, 2.7 miles an hour, 70% relative humidity. Could be a little drier, but we just had recent rain, which is good news because the bees are all out getting nectar and pollen still. The forage is great. The sequences that you saw in the opening today we're all captured this morning right here. So that shows you what's going on. We have a lot of good stuff still coming in. The very best weather is still yet to come. Saturday and Sunday, it's going to be in the 70s, 71 and 73. But if you're in the northeastern United States, I realize that what I'm saying right now may not apply to you. But for those that are in the northeast and near me, you have Tuesday and Wednesday are going to be the very best bee management days because it's going to be 77 degrees Fahrenheit for both. And you know, the weather people, they're never wrong. Air quality is excellent. So no more smoke issues from Canada. So that's about it. If you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and you'll see all the topics and there'll be some links to other videos that will give you more information that I hope will be helpful. Guess what else? It's a podcast. Podbean. You can also just Google search the Way to Be podcast and you'll find out who's carrying it. iHeartRadio, they're all carrying this very YouTube video. So, of course, it's just the audio, but the good news is there'll be timestamps also. So, if you're listening as a podcast, look in the description of the podcast and there'll be timestamps and links to this video. So, if you got to see something that you're just listening to while you're working, then you can do that. So what else? I think that's pretty much it. Let's get right into it. If you want to know how to submit your own questions, please go to the main website, which is thewaytobe.org, and uh, type in your own topic for consideration. So the very first question today comes from Brent, Tucson, Arizona. I have some multiple examples where beekeepers will remove full frame of brood and bees from a heavily populated colony and then place the same frame into a less populated colony for the purposes of strengthening or equalizing the colonies, both being queen right. I've tried this myself as well, and receiving colony doesn't seem to notice or care, or I got lucky. I'm curious why this equalization process doesn't incite an immediate attack and or defense behavior within the hive, just as we would see when a foreigner a forager that's foreign to the colony is trying to enter at the landing board. What makes an entire frame of bees entering the hive okay? Or are there any risks to be aware of? So anyway, I'll jump right into that. This is timely too, because um, a lot of people will be combining their beehives this time of year if you find out that you are not queen right. But in this case, they're both queen right. So what's going on? Uh, the bees, it goes by pheromone, and if you just put one or two bees on the landing board trying to get in, by the way, we're entering high robbing periods, so I'll talk about that at the very end or in the fluff section today, but it's exactly right. One or two bees, and in some cases you introduce a new queen in a cage, even with if you've lost your queen, and uh, if you do it just the queen by herself, sometimes she can be rejected and then get attacked and they kill the queen and they just weren't ready for. So the thing is, when you put in an entire frame of brood, that brings a really overwhelming new pheromone into the hive, and they can't focus on just one bee. So it's kind of a mass takeover. And uh, when that happens, they're just accepting. Guess who else is with them? Those are the nurse bees. Those are the most passive bees in your beehive. So it's also, let me just add to that, a very easy way to boost when you're installing a new queen. If with your new queen, you bring uh, a frame of brood with her and install that frame of brood, introducing that new unrelated pheromone to the colony, and then you also introduce a queen in her cage at the exact same time, 
uh, things pan out pretty quick. So also we know that uh, sometimes it's been funny to me that when you're combining colonies, so we lost a queen on one colony and we'll just take that colony that's going to die out and put them on a colony that's queen right, it is amazing how quickly they establish themselves and that they're accepted even by the others because what did you bring with them? Resources too. So it's not just that you invaded your colony, but you brought a bunch of new resources and new stock and uh, bees that are young are very passive and so very little fighting happens. I don't know why, that's my guess. So it is an easy way to combine bees. Here's another thing I've been doing lately, talking about playing with pheromones and stuff. If you've just collected a new swarm of bees, so they're still in whatever your transport system is. So maybe you've got, you know, a box, a beehive that you took out with you, shook a swarm into it, and now you bring it back. Um, I'm coming to the end of this practice, but I'm using it still. I have the little zip ties with the QMP, the queen mandibular pheromone, which is sold as temp queen. I have that on a branch and it just gradually builds up a little cluster of bees around the pheromone. So here's what I do. So I wanna boost a colony that I'm installing new in my apiary. So recently I collected a swarm that's feral, which is really good news to me because that means they've been surviving on their own. We go through a second uh, high swarm period here in Northwestern Pennsylvania in the Northeastern United States. And so even feral colonies that are living on their own, completely unattended by people, um, you'll get a late season swarm. They're doomed. They're absolutely doomed. I don't care. It's too late for them. So you have nothing to lose but to collect them and put them in a hive yourself. Now, this is a time of year where people have troubles getting beekeepers to respond to going out and collecting swarms for that reason, because the chances of that swarm even surviving are so low. Uh, but so what I did is I brought it back, put it in a single deep five frame nucleus hive. And uh, because I just wanted to fool with them anyway, nothing to lose. So then at the same time that I did this install, I also went over to my branch with the QMP, which had a good sized cluster. We're talking easily a thousand bees or more. They're volunteers. They want to go to another hive. That's why they followed the pheromone onto that tree branch with no hope for the future. So I shake them into my cotton net. And then I also, at the time of installing the other bees, just park the cotton net with the uh, ring of the net right on the landing board. And then they just join in. It's really interesting. They don't know each other. So they, they just, it's because the entire colony is in a state of flux. They're just being installed into a new hive. And so all the bees even that are with them may not be from the same colony. I'm learning that more and more. That foraging bees from other unrelated colonies will just join up when there is swarm activity. They just contribute themselves to that mass of bees. So when I'm putting them on the landing board and the few that gain entry, and of course the queen is in there, they start fanning their Nasanoff glands, and what happens? Other bees join in. There is no way that they're related. And that's because I drove miles to collect the swarm. And it was a swarm that nobody was responding to these people. They had a swarm on a tree branch, eye level. So huge challenge in collecting that. Great opportunity to educate people about bees. And I hope you know that I'm being sarcastic when I say huge challenge in collecting because it really was a walk up. Let's talk about bees. They gave me permission to clip the branch. I put the swarm in. And uh, so nobody wanted to get them but I would because I like to experiment and find out what's going to happen. If these show up in spring, alive and viable, there you go, which has happened, it worked. So I had drawn comb in the box, that's important too. And uh, so when we installed them, these other bees just joined up. The ones I shook off the branch, put them in front, they all go in. And now we almost doubled the size of the swarm because what's going to happen? Why is it bad? I realize I'm using this uh, conversation from Brent to talk about more than just combining hives and why they accept that, but this all ties in because it's pheromone based. And uh, when a large number from this pheromone that's new uh, arrives, then they don't defend themselves against it. Likewise, the swarm that I collected miles away, brought home, put them in a box, they welcomed a whole bunch of unrelated bees. There was no fighting on the landing board. 
They just all decided to go in, and if we didn't know that I collected them from two entirely different locations, if we didn't know that in advance, we would make an assumption that, oh, they're all from the same queen. They're just following her pheromone, and they're going in, but they don't. They're in a state of survival, and uh, they just join up and fortify each other's numbers. And also, I think this happens a lot with swarms everywhere. Random bees join swarms, and in that state of swarming or combining colonies and things like that, you'll have bees joining them that are not related, and they accept them. It's interesting. Keep in mind, too, that uh, bees that swarm out from a colony are fully fortified. They have a lot of resources with them, and bees with resources are always welcome. It's the beggars that they don't like. Who's being kicked out right now that falls into the beggar category? The uh, drones, the male bees, are being tossed. Question number two comes from Dialed N. That's the YouTube channel name. It says, uh, I would like to hear more about your in your Q&A about cut comb honey. I understand what it is how it's harvested, but why is it so popular? I've come across it at restaurants and hotels, but each time I use it, it just seems to be more of a chore than what it's worth. Where does the appeal lie? And this ties right in, and the reason that this comment was made is because I just posted a video about uh, cut comb. So you may be sitting there listening or watching and thinking, what's cut comb? Well, here's your chance to see it. I had to go get this one out of the freezer because my wife has put all of the cut comb in the freezer. And this is a small container. Look, it's two inches by four inches by inch and a half in thickness. So this is an eight ounce, seven or eight ounce piece of cut comb. And uh, the other thing is when people see cut comb, it has curb appeal. And by that, I mean people that have never seen it before. Keep in mind, not everyone out there is a beekeeper. So you can give somebody a jar of honey and they go, oh, honey, that tastes really good, right? And it does, especially if it's real honey that came from a real beekeeper. Let me get to that in a minute. But uh, comb honey is interesting because you have an opportunity to talk to people about what comb honey is. My own daughter was amazed by the fact that the bees made that. In other words, what, how do bees make beeswax? And so my grandson was walking around grilling me heavy on exactly how bees make wax and uh, what the metabolism is that causes them to do that. I had to explain about uh, the wax glands on the bee's abdomen, that there are eight of them, four down each side. And then we had to go to the observation hives and we had to show how that all works and that the bees have to consume resources to do that. But here's the cool thing. When you offer somebody cut comb or honey in the comb, which is exactly what it is. And on the top, of course, it's covered. They're capped with beeswax. Everything in here came from a bee. That's cool because they build the structure. They build the comb themselves. They fill the cells with the honey that they make. They cap the cells and preserve the honey again with beeswax that comes from the wax glands of the worker honey bee. And so it is a tiny miracle. And so what a fantastic thing to even look at. But the question from dialed in, dialed N is, um, why is it popular? Well, First of all, aside from the curb appeal, the fact that it looks interesting and that it's a conversation piece that you can eat. Kids love to bite it. I don't know how you grew up, but when I was in fifth grade and I had a cough, I remember the first time my mom gave me cut comb to calm a cough. And so I could chew that comb, honey. And I just used to chew the wax for a while and spit it out. But uh, back in the day, and when I say that, I mean back in the early days of honey production in the United States and probably elsewhere around the world, you're going to find this unbelievable, but true, there were fakers out there. There were people that simply made syrup, thickened it down, and sold it as honey. So even back in the early last century, people were selling honey that was not honey. So one of the ways that you could avoid being frauded or having somebody get you to buy something that was complete fakery, they provided comb honey and people had a preference for it. That's because if you had honeycomb 
and you were selling your honey still in the comb, that was evidence that bees had made it. So it actually became very popular back in the day because it was a way to avoid honey fraud, which today is rampant. So if you just do a, a cursory Google search and search for honey that isn't and find out how often and on what scale we're being frauded when it comes to honey. So the honeycomb is very popular. And so who buys it? Well, so if you've met a lot of old people, I'm not counting myself as the old people, but if you met like old people, like really old people, you would find that they still love honey in the comb. Why? They have childhood memories related to that. Uh, the other thing is uh, we also have the four by four size. So four inches wide, four inches long, roughly inch and a quarter to an inch and a half thick. Um, the four by four is not so popular. And here's, here's what occurs to me about that. When you sell them the two inch wide section, it's very easy to pick it up and bite a piece right off the end of it, right? So just like a candy bar, you just eat it. And uh, you can just take chunks off, of course, and just give it to people. But it seems like this is an easier sell. And uh, I'm gonna talk about that. Oh yeah, I do wanna talk about it. Let's talk about how popular it is. Because it did strike me, I looked it up when we started harvesting it. And by the way, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about comb honey now. Because I've done Ross rounds in the past. And to do Ross rounds, and I still like them. I have uh, two Ross round supers yet to pull. And uh, so it's like pre-packaged honey. Look at the amount of processing that it took to get this out. You cut it with a cutter, and in this case, in the video, and I hope you watch it, I use the Pierce comb cutter. It's an electric comb cutter, plugs in. It only came out a couple of years ago. I picked it up, not last January, but the January before at the Hive Life Conference. So two by four, and then they came out with a four by four later. I put myself on the waiting list for that one because I really wanted it. This helps me out because what kind of frames do I have that I don't have an extractor for, lay-ins frames. Lay-ins frames have vertical wires going through them. Guess what I can do? It's all basically foundationless comb. So what I do, it's another question that people asked, how did I keep the comb straight? So I do foundation, foundationless, foundation, foundationless. It's called checkerboarding. So I use the, the comb that has foundation, the frames that have foundation as a guide for those that are foundationless. Now this is very important that your hives be level. It has to be absolutely level side to side. We tilt them towards the landing boards a little bit to help out in the winter time. Side to side is critical because the comb hangs vertical. Bees work with gravity. Remember they're working in the dark. They don't look at visual guides, right? So by having a block there, then we cut down on some of the wonky comb, but even wonky comb probably wouldn't be the end of the earth when you're talking about cut comb. So now you can cut the comb, these big thick chunks, you put them in boxes, so you cut them to size. You can also use just a regular knife, a serrated knife, a hot knife, something like that. But I will tell you this, the Pierce hot comb cutter, it was super easy. Watch the video. They're absolutely precise and each comb is cut perfectly to fit into these boxes. These boxes are over a dollar a piece, so they're reusable though. So you can charge a deposit to somebody and or give them a discount if they give one back. You know, you can find ways to cover that cost, but they can be cleaned and reused. I like that idea. So anyway, what processing went into it? You went to your hive, you got the bees off of the comb, you pulled the comb, you cut the comb, you put the cut comb in a box or some container you cycled it into the freezer for 48 hours, just as an insurance policy. I have never had cut comb demonstrate that it had eggs or, you know, wax moth larvae in it, which would then of course grow up to be wax worms and then later wax moths, but they eat everything. I've never had one in there, but as a precaution so that you don't give somebody cut comb that has something living in it or on it, Cycle it through your freezer for 48 hours. That's all. That's where this one's been. And it's just now, it's still foggy right now, but it's, uh, it's clearing up. So that's all the processing. So no extractor, no uncapping tank, no honey mess at all. 
I use a great big cookie sheet. It's not even that big. And then there's a stainless steel grid that's a standoff that the cut comb sits on while the edges drain down onto the cookie sheet. And then it goes and it's done. That is simple processing. So the appeal is wide and we have a waiting list for it. Us here, personally. But I did want to talk about this because I did some Google searching. Of course, who doesn't? I find this on Amazon. So look at cut comb on Amazon. You're about to be blown away. First of all, I don't know if I should name the companies because when I looked into the company, I found out it's not an American product at all, but it looks like it. So when you go on Amazon or anywhere else that has a lot of these marketers on there, you will find lots of cut comb, honey in the comb for sale, and you'll find a broad range of prices. And so it really struck me, just look to see what the most popular ones, which ones does Amazon promote to you first? Well, one, it says, um, I can't name it. I just don't want to. But uh, the company says they come from Brooklyn, New York. So the company's in Brooklyn, New York. So you think, ah, good old Brooklyn honey. And then you find out that uh, they have ratings very high, four out of five, four and a half out of five stars, 4,548 ratings on this cut comb. And it's the seven ounce. So that's this size, seven ounces. Could be eight ounces, put seven. You have to let people know how many ounces they're buying. What does seven ounces of that cut comb sell for on Amazon with Amazon Prime delivery? $14.99 a piece for that. Okay, let's keep going. How many of those, here's another thing, when you look at products, this is how many of this product have sold over the past month? Well, over the past month, more than a thousand sold in one month. Do you think that's one beekeeper? Then you look into the fine print and you find out, oh, it's a product of Hungary. So it's really not American made and sold honey products. It's just sold through an American company. So I suggest that people that are looking to buy honeycomb, that they always look a little deeper. Oh, that's a seller. Oh, that's a processor. Oh, that's a bottler. They're not actually producing the honey themselves. And another of the top sellers on Amazon, the comb honey was coming from Turkey. But again, American companies and people see that name. And because even on the title, it says born in Brooklyn, New York, right on the honey pack. And then on the back, it will say product of Hungary. So here's the best part. Let's put that together. More than a thousand sold in the last month. So that puts that seller at $14,990 per month in sales on these honey products. That's impressive. So what I'm saying is there's a market. And if people are glowing about that product, and it's a free market, I mean, you can get into it, you can sell your stuff. You have to find out what your state requirements are for you to even be able to sell your own honey. So if you're going to sell it, you know, your state department of agriculture may have some restrictions and you might be vulnerable if you just start listing everything and advertising and you don't understand the rules about production, labeling, accountability, all that stuff. So check into that. But I'm just saying that, um, you know, one shallow super that makes eight of these combs per frame and you've got 10 frames in the hive, that's 80. And even if you undercut that, let's say you only sell them for 10. That's an $800 super right there. So my grandson, who thinks he's going to pay for his college with bees, and he's only, he just turned eight, uh, he might actually not be very far off. You know, if he's my direct sales representative, he's pretty uh, up to speed on everything. So it's popular. People like it. It's real and uh, very difficult to fake. And this is also why I like the, the comb that is a little wonky, the comb that has some variation in it. The cells might be a little larger at one end and smaller at another end. That is evidence to me that it was not made by somebody who's figured out how to imitate comb. I'm sure that's coming down the line. Question number three, let's move on. This is from James Townsend, JRTBs. That's the YouTube channel. Again, we're talking about cut comb because the video just came out, so a lot of people had questions. That cut comb looks great, 
and the cutting tool works perfect. I've been using a knife and it's a mess and the results aren't great. You mentioned long-term cut comb storage in a freezer. How would you store five gallon buckets of honey over winter and at what temperature? Okay, so I'm glad this question was asked because storing your honey is an interesting area and something that a lot of new beekeepers need to be aware of. Uh, we know that different things happen to your honey and it has the potential to set or become solidified. This is why I don't like crystallized honey. What does it look like? Oh man, here's some that's set, here's some the teddy bear. So this is what honey looks like that just sits in storage, but this is in jars, see? That's my glass teddy bear. I don't like the plastic bears. And then this, of course, is a regular little, I don't know if that's a pint or what the ounces are, but look, it's crystallized, absolutely. And here's the thing, this is a glass uh, bear. So all I have to do is put this in water up to the top and I can reconstitute it. In other words, it will liquefy. Nothing wrong with it though. And we have people that only want their honey in this crystal form. Because just like the honeycomb, it's evidence to them that it came from bees. Now, I don't like to leave it in the five gallon pails or seven, we have seven gallon pails too. And I don't like to leave it in there because if it solidifies in the pail, and I do, I have the heating bands and things like that, I don't like to do that. I would much rather heat a small container like this uh, than to try to deal with a big five gallon bucket. So I personally process it all right away as soon as possible while it's still liquid. So I encourage new and backyard beekeepers not to end up with these big buckets of half solidified or half crystallized or even completely crystallized honey, but your best storage temperature aside from a freezer. Very few people have freezer space. So 51 degrees Fahrenheit is going to slow the actual crystallization. Colder isn't necessarily better. Warmer is worse because also when honey is warmer, it also darkens over time and it does go through changes. So we know that honey has a very long shelf life. So, and I did mention the refrigerator or freezer. So if you've got one of those big horizontal freezers, you could put a lot of honey in it. Now the honey won't freeze itself at freezer temperatures, but it will stop all of that activity. In other words, if you put frames in there that you're gonna use cut comb from later, so you put the whole frames in and some kind of rack system that you've come up with, that would be great. It will not crystallize in those cells at freezer temperatures. So you do stop that activity because here's the risk that you have. And this is what happens to people sometimes when they pull frames of honey, they wait until the last minute and uh, they put it in storage, but it's not a freezer. It's not a walk-in freezer. So you could actually end up with, and probably have been through this if you've had bees for any amount of time, it's happened to me. I pull supers too late or I don't get to it because the weather turns bad and now they're in storage. And then in the springtime, I think, well, I'll just uncap it and cycle it then. So there are two ways to manage that that I want to talk about. So it's in the frames. You go to uncap it, and there's no liquid honey in there anymore. It's all solidified, so it's all crystallized, which is very common with late-season honey that comes from asters and goldenrod. They are known to granulate quickly. So that happens, but what I did last year for the first time is I took the whole super full of crystallized honey in the frames, in the comb still, and I put it in my heater tent, which is just a Vivo Sun, Vivo Sun, Vivo Sun, I don't know what you call it. They're grow tents, and uh, they come in different sizes. Even their biggest one is under $200. It's completely enclosed, and that's where I put my dehumidifier. I have a rack in there, and I can set the super on the rack, and uh, we let it heat up. It goes up to 98 or 99 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a dehumidifier running in there and just the fan from the dehumidifier actually brings that temperature up. And then I leave it there for two or three days at that temperature. So that did not degrade the honey at those temperatures. You still have raw honey, but here's what happens. Now go to uncap it 
and you'll find out that the honey that had crystallized in the cells is now liquid again. And while it's still warm, while it's still in the 90s, take it out, uncap it, put it in your extractor or crush and strain, whatever your method is, and go ahead and then cycle it out. So the same thing could happen with a bucket, something like that. It's a game of patience because I don't like the belly bands and I've stopped using them. Belly bands, bucket bands, heating bands, anything that has a concentrated or focused heating source up against the honey. I have concerns that that would raise the temperature right adjacent to that band too high, too fast, too focused. So I would much rather put the entire bucket, if this happened, inside a space where the entire space goes up to the 90s like a lot of commercial beekeepers have hot rooms they're all in the 90s um, and then you have a long time to let that re-liquefy at those temperatures and then once it's at that state you can run it through filtering or you can process the honey so uh, again and i would not heat anything long term the longer that you have it at that temperature the more potential for it to degrade some of the floral aspects of the honey that you have. It doesn't ruin the honey, but you'll find out that it doesn't smell as good and it doesn't taste as good as it otherwise would have if you kept it cool or uh, kept it from going over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind, inside a hive, 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit is brood temperature. So you're already talking about uh, a, an area of temperature where your honey would be in that state already inside the beehive. So it is very interesting, it's subtle, but my encouragement to all of you is, uh, as soon as you pull your honey, extract your honey, process it, whatever you're going to do, try to put it in its final containers, in the small containers, as soon as you possibly can, so that you're not dealing with these large qualities, large quantities of honey solidifying potentially in jars, and then put your jars in a dark room. Basements are great. They tend to be in the low 60s to 50s, and it's a little better. And you definitely don't want to store them anywhere where they're in direct sunlight or even where they get a lot of light. I don't know what artificial light impact has on it, but if we're failing safe and we keep them in dark rooms, we eliminated another factor that might be helping to darken or degrade your honey. So food for thought. Uh, question number four comes from Chris from Beaverton, Oregon. NOAA Climate Prediction Center is forecasting a strong El Nino year going through next year. So we can expect warmer and drier conditions for those of us in the Pacific Northwest. How can we prepare our hives to best overwinter these differences in temperature and precipitation? If the winter temperatures are unusually warm, Will the colony be more active, thus consuming more of their stores? Thanks. So for Chris, I'm not going to um, address specifically what's going to happen in the desert north, in desert northwest, in the northwest or El Ninos and, and these dramatic weather changes and things like that. Because here's what I want kind of everyone to think about. And uh, it's that if you, if you learn a system for keeping your bees where you live, and this information gets cycled back over and over by a number of different beekeepers and those who are teaching about bees. Locally acclimated bee stock is going to work really well for you. Um, so the part of this is that significant is when you have bees that are from other parts of the country that you bring in and it takes them a long time to show their adaptedness to that environment. And what I mean is uh, some of the southern bees, for example, some of the Italian stock and things like that are brought up north and uh, they're not northern bees. They're not acclimated. And this is why they tend to have huge broods going into winter and they have a lot of resource consumption going through winter. So bees that don't adapt well to dearth periods that suddenly show up where you live, uh, the cold climate, in other words, they have too large of a brood area, which means what? Just as I mentioned before, they're going to keep that brood at 94 to 97 degrees. Or if you get chilled brood, you're going to see a bunch of it being dragged out onto the landing board of your hive. So they don't have enough bees to cover that and protect it, to literally cover it and keep it warm. So in comparison, we would go to something like carniolan stock, which are darker bees, and those bees tend to draw back their brood production 
going into winter or in response to triggers in the environment that show that resources are going to be few. When they do that, we end up with smaller colonies of bees, probably left to themselves, uh, just like the feral colony that uh, the people that I got the feral colony from, that the swarm is in a bush. Uh, they have lots of bee trees in their area, but these are pretty small trees, and therefore the colonies that are inside are likewise smaller. So these aren't huge colonies of bees that you might find in more southern areas where they don't get a real freeze through the winter time. So these are pretty significant differences. But the bees' ability to respond to environmental cues, dearths, and times of plenty um, will let you know kind of which stock. You can let it distill itself. And I realize backyard beekeepers don't have a lot of stock to do that with. But every year I draw upon my own bees. I cycle back my own bees. I'm sending out my drones and the winter hardy stock. In other words, we have a challenging environment here. It can go, we can get a 40 degree shift in a single 24 hour period. That is dynamic. And so bees need to handle that, but we need to handle our bees. So we have to put them in hives that can benefit the bees when they're trying to survive whatever your climate throws at them. So for me through the years that has uh, resulted in finally having insulated inner covers, insulated outer covers, and well-fit hive equipment. That's it. Southern facing landing boards has been an improvement consistently year after year after year. Those that face south foraged earlier did better on cold days things like that combined with the fact that I'm cycling through my own stock. And this is where we get into polarizing discussions for beekeepers. And that's because you'll get a lot of people that will absolutely guarantee you that they do not have swarms, that they've mastered it, they've figured it out, their bees no longer swarm because they're ahead of the game. Uh, for me, at my end of it, swarms are something I don't mind at all. Keep in mind, and this is how I think of it, you know, and it's probably, it might be a little naive to think this way, but with every swarm that I get, I have a new queen that made it with drones from my region. In other words, as I cycle these back, and particularly in spring, I love spring swarms, and I like them to do it, because the only drones that are out there flying around are also those that have been through winter, because it's too early for those who have purchased packaged bees, nukes from the south or other places and brought them in, brought them up, brought the stock from somewhere else. Uh, the ones that are requeening early through swarming are also seeding the environment with other feral stock, hopefully. And uh, they're getting back the DNA and of course the traits from bees that also survived winter. So I like spring swarming. I like spring division splits and making new colonies. And when I do my splits, of course, these are what are called walkaway splits. I don't install queens in there. I let them make their own new queens. And usually when I'm doing splits, it's a result of doing an inspection. I look inside the hive. I see that they're creating queen cells. When they're doing that, some people will tell you to go through and cut away all the queen cells and keep your queen, stop the swarm. For me, it means, oh, I've got a bunch of queen cells and I found the queen. What a great opportunity to remove the queen with some frames, create a resource nucleus hive, which by the way, they all made it this year. And then the stock that's left behind with the queen cells that are left behind, they will produce a replacement queen and then they're back in business. And that queen that comes out, that emerges from her cell and then she matures and she flies off and she gets mated. It is early enough that she's mating with other winter hardy stock. And so it goes. So the more reproductive cycles that we have, colony after colony after colony, the more reinforcement we get in survival stock genetics where you live. Now, if things start going really bad, of course, this is why we talk about um, colonies that have high varroa mite loads and they get treated low varroa mite, varroa mite loads and they get retained and we use that stock to produce more because we want those. Now that's that's naive on my part. It's a feel-good thing. And the reason I say it's naive is that there's so many other beekeepers around me. There are beekeepers around me that I don't even know what they're doing to manage their bees. I've never had a discussion with them. 
So if my queen's flying off and mating with somebody else's stock, maybe they're heavily treated, maybe they're heavily cared for, maybe they're not Darwinian bees, maybe, you know, they're bees that need help at every turn. That's why I document my own stock and keep my own stuff around, and I try to cycle back everything. And my uh, punch in the apiary for those people is to send out as many of my drones as I can so they can mate with their, their emerging queens in spring, and then we cycle back to each other. That's what I would like to do. In a perfect world, we would all talk to each other, we'd all have a game plan, and none of us would bring in any other stock, and then we would only allow reproduction, hive-level reproduction, from the stock that is doing the best at surviving on their own. They're grooming, they're showing some hygienic traits, they are keeping the right-sized uh, brood production, and they're boosting brood at just the right time. And so... It's interesting, but what can we do to prepare for all of these weather dynamics and everything? You keep only the hardiest stock. And that might not be your biggest honey producer. That's the problem. If you get fixated on the amount of honey that you're gonna get from your bees or the amount of profit you're gonna get from your bee management practices, then that is a totally different thing. Um, so I have a bunch of colonies that there's no way we're going to pull a bunch of honey off of them. And I, I mean several colonies that did not produce enough honey for us to fill a gallon. So on the flip side, some of my colonies still had low varroa mites and still had a very good production rate when it came to honey and resources. Nothing would be more resource demanding on your bees than to produce comb honey and to cut that comb out and then expect them to pull new comb in spring. Uh, so if I have colonies that can do that, these are survivor stock, and these are bees that are doing extremely well with minimal intervention. So, and that's just, just my path forward. That's what I wanna do, uh, stock and hive configurations. So the other part of that is, when you shift all of your hive configurations into one way of keeping bees throughout your apiary, you have kind of no way of understanding which of your hive configurations benefited both you, the beekeeper, as far as accessibility and management practices, and the bees themselves. How did they do in that configuration? So eventually you figure out this kind of hive works extremely well. This kind of entrance makes it easier for my bees to defend themselves. Now, of course, there's the survivor, there's the Darwinian approach or what we used to call the Darwinian Awards for, for people that could not make intelligent decisions, therefore they were eliminated from the gene pool. The bees, the same thing. Some people say, leave them wide open and if they can defend themselves, great. If they can't, you didn't need them anyway. You want those feisty defenders. Okay, so that's again where there are so many different approaches and opinions from beekeepers. And I want to use the cues that I see. There's pressure on that landing board. There are bees that look like they're pinging the sides and underneath. They're starting to think about robbing it. We have wasps or hornets showing up. I reduce entrances. I don't want to just lose my colony because they couldn't defend themselves. The sheep could not defend themselves when the wolves showed up. So that's uh, something where we are active. I'm personally active in reducing entrances and helping those bees have an environment that would help them defend themselves. Because once again, if we entered into these debates and these discussions, and I recommend you do, there's no reason not to have these discussions. But this wide open entrance, is that something your bees would want on their own? In other words, when they pick cavities that are completely under their control and they use propolis and everything else to modify shape, reduce, or they chew to enlarge an opening, how large is the opening that they choose on their own? own. And so then you'll find out that these wide open openings are not suitable to the bees and they wouldn't even occupy a cavity that had an opening that they could not close down or seal up until it was defendable. So there again, and then you'll hear discussions and arguments. So I'm just kind of giving you what the topics are that make people challenge these configurations. And one is, well, they'll process more honey if they have a wide open landing board. I have found that not to be true. And how do I know? I run wide open landing boards and I run restricted landing boards. And I see what honey production is and what is going on inside these hives. And it's not a one-off where you just do it one year. I make these observations year after year, 
season after season until I get a consensus that this is working and this isn't. And so I don't even make the change. This is the other part of kind of the way I manage my bees. I don't give them all the same entrance configuration even now, even though I feel like I've got it dialed in pretty good. I still leave the wide open ones and I still have the narrow ones and I still have some facing west and I have some facing south and I have some facing north because I consistently through the years want to see if I'm valid in my thinking regarding what's working better for the bees. Now the good news too is they're all surviving. So wide open, narrow, they're surviving. So it's, uh, it's interesting to find out that in spite of us, the bees that have good stock, good genetics, uh, can still put up with kind of our management practices unless we're completely goofy about what we do with our bees. So um, that was the other thing early on in my beekeeping. Uh, I thought when I had what I called super colonies, and those were colonies that would be, a, they'll be double deep, Langstroth, 10 frames, and there'll be three or four medium supers on top of that, and it's all chock-a-block with honey. And I thought, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that hive together like that, my super colony, and then the other colonies, who cares about them? I'm gonna have the super colony, I'm gonna focus on it, I'm gonna leave all those resources, and then come springtime, uh, that's what I'm going to do my splits from. Well, come springtime, spring after spring, because I'm a little slow, uh, they were dead. Huge amounts of moisture in there. Uh, they did not make it. And uh, it took me a long time to learn that all that surplus honey, which was well out of reach of the bees, by the time they cluster up, uh, they go into that state of torpor, they cluster inside the hive. What's above them? Several frames, several boxes of honey up above and uh, I used to vent through the top and I had these little vents and some people said put nickels on your top of your inner cover and just vent it a little bit and somebody said put a bag of pine shavings up there and put that up there and let the, the air weep out slowly and stuff well I got bunches of soggy pine shavings and a bunch of venting going off out there and I had a huge amount of condensation because guess what happened Remember I said that where I live, we get these days where we get these 40 degree changes. That's a lot. It can go from 25 degrees in the morning to 65 or even 70 degrees by the same afternoon. What happens with all of that honey up there? It's still cold when the outside warms, condensation forms on it, drips down. Where does it drip down? Straight onto my bees. And this is where I learned I have to pull off surplus honey beyond what my bees are going to need to get them through winter. And I've arrived at one medium super that's chock-a-block with capped honey is all my bees need. And I have a two box, a deep and a medium configuration. The largest setup that I have going through winter is two deeps. And so with that, after all those years of killing bees, I now have a very good winter survival rate. So sizing things right, equipping your bees, and we'll talk more about this at the very end, but when we talk about El Nino and all these other parts of the country where I don't keep bees, what would be my method? To find out what stock is going to do best where I live, and you're gonna find out that creating mutts, hybrid bees that are just gathered from your immediate vicinity and if you have the ability to manage them and can keep them going and find out which ones are fighting varroa that are not diseased that are bringing in lots of propolis because that's medicinal for your hive all of these things come together and the better beekeeper you are you will be able to keep bees anywhere so once you master those skills long answer to a short question question number five comes from Teddy C. That's the YouTube name. Just going to ask the basic beekeepers questions. Oh, this was talking about uh, the yellow jacket nests that I took off the side of my house. That's right. They were on the side of my own house building a nest like this. And I did video sequences of them building up. I wanted to see if they were the ones trying to raid my beehives. I only had one beehive that they were even getting access to. 
that's done. They, they've given up on that one. But there are questions here because as a beekeeper, you're going to encounter yellow jackets quite a bit. In fact, other people may call you up and say, hey, I have a swarm of bees, do you want them? And you zip over there only to find out it's a bunch of yellow jackets or even worse, bald-faced hornets. That used to happen. That's why we say, hey, could you just take a picture with your cell phone, send it to me so I can identify the bees because they will swear up and down that they're honeybees. And then you get there and they're wasps. So the more information you have about wasp biology and yellow jackets and bald-faced hornets and rarer to find the cavity, but even in my son and daughter-in-law's backyard, 20 feet from their patio, they had a tree with Vespa Crebro, which is the European hornet. They had a whole nest of them right by their patio. So anyway, the first question is, was there a queen they depend on? Okay, there is a queen in those uh, paper wasp nests, yellow jackets or otherwise, there's always a queen who's laying the eggs, producing the workers that are doing the work. If the queen's removed, would the hive survive winter? And so here's the distinction. Often people look at hornets and wasps and things and refer to that as a hive. The hive is really for bees. And when it comes to wasps and hornets and things like that, those are nests. So I understand. Just little distinctions though. The nest is for your wasps, the hive is for your bees. And the hive is the structure. Okay, so now we get in there, they have a paper nest. Now, whether that nest is in an attic, in a shed, underground, on the side of a house, or hanging from a tree, it's a paper nest. It's made out of cellulose. So anyway, if the queen was removed, would the hive survive winter? So this nest would not survive winter, and here's why. They're not designed to. Now, let's make a distinction. If you're in the south, if you're in an area where it never freezes, I suppose these nests could just grow and grow and grow. Uh, I did see a really weird picture of an entire shed that was covered in wasp paper. It was pretty bizarre. I think they had a easy chair or something stored in there and even that was completely engulfed. Pretty nightmarish. But up where we live, northeastern United States, are places where it freezes. They don't winter. So here's what happens. And actually, this is a great protection for wasps. And this is some of the distinctions between honeybees in particular. Honeybees have a perennial nest. In other words, they're going to use the same cavity over and over. In our case, the way you manage them in hives, they use the same comb over and over for brood. And then they have their pollen stores and then they have their honey stores, right? And it just cycles year after year after year in the exact same space. Therefore, keep in mind the new things that are happening to them. And by new, I mean, we're talking about insects that have existed for thousands of years beyond that. And uh, now we're managing them, right? So we have agriculture now, which we did not have on this level and using pesticides the way they are now. This is new stuff. So what's happening is it's being stored in beehives inside their comb. The wax of the comb binds a lot of negative material over the years. That's why we cycle out old comb, particularly brood comb, every five years. It's really dark. It's black. It's fibrous. It's not good for anything. Cut it out. Get rid of it. Okay. Because it's concentrating toxins to the point where it could impact your hive. So I bring that up because wasps are better off than the honeybees when it comes to that. And it's because they don't reuse those paper nests. Just by, think of it, they made a nest out of paper. It's like paper mache. And the one that I did in my video, which I'll link to this question, I just cut into it with a knife and I cut it all apart to look at all the parts of it. But it was really like just cutting through kind of rigid tissue paper. It really wasn't tough at all. And that's why they constantly have to rework it. But guess what does not happen in the cells in a wasp nest or a hornet's nest? These toxins from the environment do not build up in those nests. And that's because every year they start fresh, brand new one. That's why also, if you're dealing with a paper wasp nest, when we go to my Way to Be Academy building and we look up in the gable on the porch, there's a great big paper wasp nest there. It's more than a year old. It's empty. 
they don't reuse it. In fact, in the spring, scout wasps will not go through and move into an existing nest. They build it fresh. So look at the protection that's built into that. They're not cycling into potentially residue-filled nest cavities. And I'll take this a step further too, just because I want to talk about it, because it's interesting to me. Let's talk about these feral bees and feral cavities. And when the honeybees build their nests in there, we think, well, if they're not managed, then what happens to them? Well, there are many times when they swarm out and there's the queen cells that they leave behind don't make it. So then we have a colony that just dwindles and dies. What's left in there? So now we have an unprotected perennial honeybee. The hive is the tree. So that's the cavity that they're in. And then all that old comb is in there. This is very interesting. Uh, we have a recycling system. So what's going to happen? Well, if you've got small hive beetles, they're going to be in there pretty darn quick. And they're going to go after all the stored pollen. They're going to go after any honey. They're going to slime everything out. They're going to be super disgusting. And then their larvae are going to wiggle right out. All those little worms are going to go right out of it. And they're going to go into the ground. They're going to go down the tree. They travel great distances. But guess what else comes in? Because this is cool. The wax moth flies in there and lays her eggs all over this old toxic comb. Now, what's interesting about this is, uh, what if you had American fowl brood in there? Which, if this were in a beehive and you were inspected, you found out you had American fowl brood, you'd have to burn everything, right? You have to destroy it, get rid of it. And then it has to be buried. And that's under the supervision of some state inspector. But what about those feral colonies where they have the really old comb in there and they get fowl brood what happens to that comb? Does it just continue to spread it forever? Listen to this. These wax worms not only chew up all the fiber, all of the comb, leaving their little webs everywhere. It's pretty disgusting, right? They consume even American or European foul brood, infected brood comb. And what happens to it when it goes through the wax worms metabolism? It is broken down and no longer contagious. That is nature's recyclery. So when these waxworms get in there, and then the waxworms, they have to get out of there, and they have to finish their reproductive cycles, right? But what happens is these birds show up, and they start eating them, and woodpeckers get them, and everything else. It's a miracle that they survive. Because now we've got a honeybee cavity that's been cleaned out, and then what shows up again? Well, it smells good because it has propolis lining everywhere. And it's been inhabited by bees before. So that following spring, what happens? Scout bees from other colonies in a perfect world find that cavity. And then they move in and they start building brand new comb. And the cycle continues. So without the care and without the maintenance of beekeepers, these are things that could be happening inside these feral colonies that keep them going year after year after year. And so very interesting about the wax moth and its larvae and what those wax worms are capable of consuming and what the product of that consumption is later and how harmless it is. Very interesting stuff. And so this gets right into what do they feed on during winter? Well, I will tell you what happens with the paper wasps where I live, yellow jackets, bald faced hornets, at the end of the cycle, which we're coming up on now, as nights get really cold, they start to realize they're not going to survive. They produce queens, and they also produce males, so the equivalent of drones in the beehive. But where in the honey beehive, drones from the same genetics, from the same hive, do not mate with queens produced by that same colony. So these virgin queens fly out, they mate with unrelated drones from other colonies. Now let's shift over to the paper wasp, the yellow jackets, and uh, you'll find out that they produce their own males and they produce their own queens. And then these males mate with the queens from their own colony, from the same genetic line. And then what happens is these queens fly out on their own. They're solitary through winter and they dig under tree bark and things like that. They find humus, they find sheltered places and they winter on their own, and then in spring, the percentage of those queens, so this is natural selection again, nature's brutal. Only the queens that did what they needed to do to survive winter 
will emerge in spring from wherever this cover is, and then they'll start and each individual queen produces her own colony. So she'll start by making her paper nest, which means she's gonna go and chew on weathered wood and unprotected wood and things like that. She's gonna make that nest, she's gonna lay some eggs, and the first of her brood that emerge will become the workers and then they take over all of these housekeeping duties, which includes foraging, bringing back resources, building and maintaining the nest and expanding it. And that's why we're at this time of year when these nests are as big as they're gonna be. Very interesting stuff. So they don't, they go into dormancy. And then the next part here, it says, do mites or small high beetles attack them in high areas off the ground? So the Varroa destructor mite does not feed on wasps and hornets at all. They don't. And uh, as far as small hive beetles, small hive beetles don't either because there's nothing stored in those nests. When you tear apart a yellow jacket nest, you'll find that they have brood. They'll have eggs, they'll have larvae, or they'll have capped pupa. They don't store honey, they don't store pollen. First of all, they're not bringing pollen in at all because the protein for bees is pollen. The protein for wasps and hornets is meat protein that's coming from animals that they are killing and feeding on. So it's animal protein that gets fed to their developing larvae. So you could kind of look at honeybees as vegan wasps. So they have totally different diets and that's why there's nothing for the small honey beetle to eat in there. So. And uh, that's it. So that'll answer those questions that I hope, because as beekeepers, we get asked a lot of questions. And one of the borderline annoying things is that everything's called a bee. I, I was mowing my yard and a bunch of bees stung me 20 times and they're talking about wasps. So the more we know about the annual cycles of these different insect species that are capable of stinging, the more we can help reinforce the distinction between what a honeybee is, what they do, where you find them, what their nests are like, what the cavities are like that they occupy. And then we can also talk about the wasps and the hornets and things like that. I find that often beekeepers focus exclusively on honeybees and don't seem to know much or anything at all about the wasp species and what their capabilities and annual cycles are. So I think it's very helpful, the more you know about them, then also the more you understand why they're attacking your colony, what they're after. Moving on to question number six. This is from C. Harrison, 2005. So that's the YouTube channel name. And it says, Fred, do you use the escape board on the Apame hives? So the escape board, this is the bee escape, my favorite one. There's a bunch of different ones. After I wreck everything, this is an escape board too. This is an escape board. So do they work on Apame hives? Because Apame doesn't make an escape board. I'm kind of surprised actually because they really have done a great job of making all the other useful tools. But here's the thing, for the bee escape, this by the way goes up, this is the bottom. So this faces down. You're gonna put your super on top of this that you want the bees to clear out of. They're gonna go through the bottom and they're gonna go into the hive below. And then that lets you just pull the box off. This takes about 24 hours. I like to put these on the evening before, late afternoon the day before, and then the following morning before everybody is flying a lot. So I like to get out there just as it's warming and pull that box off and take it with the honey and everything else. These wooden escapes are pretty inexpensive, but here's what I want you to know about these. And by the way, the Apame hive boxes, the supers do set right over the top of these just fine. So they work together. Uh, and they come in eight or 10 frames. But here's a modification I'm gonna recommend to those of you who already have these wooden ones or people that make them themselves. One of the reasons I like the Great Escape, which is made by Cirocell, which uh, is sold out of New Zealand. They have a bunch of slats running the full length, as we can see it here. So when the bees come down into the bottom, they try to get back up top, but they come out of these cones 
and they're trying to get up because they smell what's up above here. So the bees get clustered up underneath this box here. So I'm gonna make a recommendation. If you have these already, I recommend drilling two inch holes in the corners all the way around. Maybe even more than two inches. I don't care either way. And then what I also recommend you do is you buy number eight screen, which is what this looks like here. And you cover these holes with it because then what's going to happen is the bees will go out through this escape and they will not be able to get back up in, but they will be drawn to these scent areas. They'll be trying to get up there and that keeps them from figuring this out. Here's what I found out with my bees. The way this is configured right now, the only hole, the only vent is in the middle. So the bees are scenting that and they're constantly tooling around trying to get back up. If you leave this on for more than a day, look at all the wax and propolis they've already built up on here. The bees figure this out and they go right through and they go right in and right back up. This is a much less, as is, a much less effective escape board than the Cirrusel. And I think it's because the bees can smell what's going on and they're trying to go up in different areas and they don't figure out the Cirrusel as quickly as they do. Now I've never left it on. That's probably a good experiment. If you left it on for several days, would they figure out the Cirrusel and be coming up through these cones? Less likely, but it could happen. And I have Cirrusels too that have fur comb all over them as well. So it does. Apame, the 8 and 10 frame size Apame hives, they're flared out at the bottom. Those sit right over the top of those escape boards. So they do work. And, another, and you definitely want to leave them overnight, though. It's not fast. But it is very effective, very clean. Question number seven comes from Kelly. And uh, says, question, how do you store your wax bricks? So once you've rendered your beeswax and you've whatever your process is, you end up with disks of wax. And Kelly did send photos of uh, the wax here. I had two discs, about two pounds each, in storage in my basement. I live in New Jersey. Imagine my surprise when I encountered evidence of wax moths, larvae, and silk between the two brick discs. Does this happen to you? Should I be storing it with a paramoth sachet or something else? Please let me know. Thanks. Okay, so here's the thing. Does it happen to me? No, because... I store my stuff right. So here's the thing. This bucket, these buckets, by the way, food grade buckets. This, you know what this is? This is a really old, um, this was my first honey bucket from 2007 when I bought it. And I used to get 74 pounds roughly of honey into this. But anyway, food grade bucket, these lids that come, that's what I want to talk about. These are spin-on lids. If you've never seen these before, you're in for a treat because this is for storing anything in your buckets. You know, they come with those white lids that you have to pry off. And I have a fancy aluminum pry bar that has a hammer built on it so you can hammer those back on and everything. But I want you to look at the edge of this. It's got a gasket. See that white gasket up there? These are good for food storage and a lot of things. But you buy these caps. I got this one from Amazon. No great surprise. And why did I choose orange? They come in yellow, orange, green, black. They're cheaper or more expensive depending on, depending on which color you choose. So orange was the cheapest one. So check that out. But anyway, they come in two parts. The threaded part and then this ring which attaches to your bucket. And it really attaches. And there's a gasket in here. Now, the reason I bring this up is because your wax, beeswax discs, or anything else you want to store and protect from anything, you can drop that right in here. And uh, by the way, your wax, here's the thing. When did those wax worms get on your beeswax? It had to be after rendering because the rendering temperatures alone would take them out, right? So once you render your beeswax, and for those of you who are paying attention to thinking about processing beeswax this year, 
Be very careful about the parameters that you use when you melt your beeswax because if you use too high a temperature, you're going to mess up your wax. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be great in aromatics. So look up your wax melting temperatures. Make sure that you're just over the melting point and you can find out that your wax is much softer, more aromatic and everything else. That said, moving on. You get your wax, you drop it in this bucket and then you close it up. And one of the reasons that I like these lids too is because I like to sit on buckets. So if you're sitting in your bee yard or wherever, or you can even bring one of these out when you're doing your work and you're collecting beeswax and scraping it off and your propolis and stuff like that, chuck it in these buckets, put these lids on. Nothing gets in there, nothing gets to them, and you can stack them up. And that's the other thing. Uh, not only is it sturdy enough for you to sit on, but I think they're going to last pretty much forever. But you can stack them and uh, have bucket on top of bucket. But anyway, that's going to protect your beeswax. So what I recommend is, whenever you've rendered your beeswax, right after it's cool enough to handle, that's when I would put it in some kind of storage. Now you could cycle it through the freezer. I don't think it's necessary for rendered beeswax because it's too hot, as I mentioned, going through processing. So they had to find it and attack it later on. So buckets, that's my number one thing for that. That was my last question for the day. We're into the fluff section. So this time of year, we are talking about September the 29th. This is where your beekeeping logbooks come into play. This is very important. At what time last year did you have the worst robbing? At what time last year did you have problems that were uh, time of the year related? So that's why I'm ahead of the game this year, probably more ahead of the game than I ever have been. I don't want to brag, but I'm on top of stuff now, and not just because the supervisor is coming out again. He's showing up this afternoon because he says we have to inspect his bees, and so I have to accommodate him. Um, so the supervisor, for those of you who don't know, is my grandson. He's eight years old, and uh, he is on top of things more than I would ever expect. So remember that you're still packing down. Remember the story about me leaving my super hive together, depending on where you live. Now, if you don't have condensation, if you don't have freezing temps and things like that, you can get away with more than I can. If you live in the tropics somewhere, good for you. I don't. So... I like where I live though, because it really gives me an opportunity to take them through all the weather dynamics from summer heat to winter freezes. So we can really see what's going on. So remove all your surplus equipment. If you've got hives or supers that they never quite finished out the frames and things like that, pull them anyway. Don't wait. You're running out of time. So pull them now. All entrances, if they're not reduced already, get reduced now because um, as you saw in the opening sequences, we do have a lot of flowers still. We have a lot that are, what I look for when I'm walking around outside, I don't want to just see what flowers are on. Goldenrod is still here, even though it looks like it's gone away, but there's some other species of goldenrods out there, of goldenrod. And, uh, we've got asters still going strong. The hyssop makes my day because that stuff just keeps on giving. Hyssop is fantastic. So what I'm looking at though is how many of them are in bloom and I look at the buds that are not yet blooming. And that's very critical because if everything is in bloom and I don't see any buds waiting to bloom, we're at the end of it. And here's what I recommend. So if we're in the classroom right now and, and you're my mentees and I'm trying to get you through your first winter, I want you to do all your packing down. I want you to do all of your hive configuration changes and modifications if you're going to do them. Um, I want you to do that now because we want to leave the bees with the time to finish sealing the cracks that you're going to make. When you break boxes apart, when you pull inner covers off and things like that, you break the propolis seal. When you do that, your bees need warmth and time to fix it. So this is where historically, if you waited until the last minute and the weather got out of hand and you went out there on a 60 degree day because two weeks down the road. I mean, it just looked like the next two weeks are going to be rain and sleet and all that stuff. It could happen. Give your bees time, pack them down now. And uh, the next thing is verify that they're queen right. Now I had some hives swarm. 
I need to get eyes on their queens. I need to know that they're going to survive winter. There is not a lot of time left. So if we're out of drones, we're out of queens. Because if we get queens now and there aren't drones for them to mate with, how far down the road are we? We're deep into October. Too late. It's not going to work. So it's time to admit that some of these colonies will not requeen and that if they're queenless right now, those are also the first ones to get robbed, by the way. I had people write me over the past week that were um, asking for help with robbing that's going on. In other words, even though they reduce the entrance, they're doing all of these things, they're taking all of these steps, and the colonies are still being robbed, attacked by yellow jackets and things like that. When I find colonies like that, historically, it has always been the case that the colony, when all the other colonies are holding their own just fine, and there's the one, it's proven to be queenless. And I don't know how they know it. I don't know if they're losing guard bees. I don't know what's going on, but they tend to get overrun fairly easily. And uh, when I make that comparison right now, uh, I even have nucleus hives that are scout killers. In other words, nothing is getting in those nukes, including that feral colony, that feral swarm that I collected, that are in their little box by themselves. They have a one inch by three eighths of an inch entrance. One inch by three eighths of an inch. It's very small. And let me tell you something, nothing gets in there that is not welcome. They are holding their own and it is pretty darn exciting to see that if they make it, I'm going to be very excited. But anyway, packing down, entrance reduction, uh, do all of these things now so that your bees can adapt to what you've done. Pull off partial supers, give up on them, get them off of there. And uh, if you've got, you know, if they're half capped with honey and things like that, you can go ahead and process those. So the other thing that you can do with that is if you're pulling partial supers, they're really lightweight, most of the cells are open and things like that, temporarily store them. And then as uh, the weeks pass and all this forage goes away, that's when you set out your robbing station well away from your apiary. I can't stress that enough. So if you have property that's fairly large or small, the farthest point on your property from your apiary is where you should be putting your robbing station. I also like to make it a consistent place. So that's where when all these forages are out and there's no forage to get, they start attacking other beehives. Your strongest colonies of bees will be the biggest offenders. They will absolutely put ridiculous pressure on your other colonies and they will try to rob them out. Let's divert them. So set a robbing station out there because it's the end of the year and let them fly out there and clean up those frames for you. Let them recover some of that honey. It gives them something to do. And then they'll of course bring that back to the colonies and we don't care which colonies get those. So leave on for those of you who are really trying to show all your friends how successful you are at keeping bees by showing how much honey you've collected. Please don't do that at the cost of your colony's resources that they need to get through winter. Here's another area where different beekeepers have different approaches. So some people will say, take all the honey off, all of it, and then extract those frames and put that super right back on. And then you feed them two to one sugar syrup to backfill and give them what they need for winter. That's what people do. And they've done it for a long time. And commercial beekeepers have set a standard for that. And it works for them. For me, it does not work. That's not what I want to do for my bees. So in other words, I would rather leave the medium super on the hive that's capped wall to wall with that beautiful honey that is very enticing. Look at the money you could get, about 47 pounds. So you could get four gallons of honey or leave it on for the bees to get through winter. So the economics of that would be that you could extract it, sell the honey, make a profit, clean the frames, back feed sugar syrup two to one. So that's two. So for example, that would be um, 16 pounds of dry sugar to one gallon of water. And you have to really heat it up to get that to blend. And then you're feeding that back as your carbohydrate to get through winter. 
I much prefer to leave them on because remember, honey is not my business. Bees and bee knowledge, that's my business. So I don't sell stuff. <laughs> so that's, think about who you're listening to right now. So when I leave honey on, I'm giving up potential profits to do that. So I'm telling you both sides of it. For those that pull it off and extract and then put that super right back on and then they put buckets of honey or sugar syrup on, heavy syrup, to refortify just in time to get them through winter. So if you've listened to me through the years, my very first thing in spring is the deep, which is their brood box. They get a medium super and until they cap a medium super that is nothing but honey, anything above that is what I will take. So 40 pounds, 47 pounds, whatever it ends up being of honey gets my bees through winter. So beyond those bottom two boxes, everything above that is mine. If the colony never produces a surplus above that because they did multiple swarms or whatever the reasons were, then I don't take away that initial resource that they developed early in the year. So I know going into summer that I have colonies that have already provisioned themselves in preparation for winter because keep in mind, that's what your honeybees are doing anyway. They're actually hoarding nectar and honey so that they can survive winter that's what they're doing all summer long so that's the flip side so that's what i do and we did get good honey this year but i always leave on i'm not back feeding sugar syrup period so those are choices that you make and then uh, make your hive configuration changes now so they can glue it up and seal those joints do careful inspections look at all your joints make sure they're good sealed up and uh here's the other thing it's still warm this is your time to build new hive equipment if you're putting together hive boxes and things like that you want to take advantage of end of the year sales and stuff like that if you're going to build frames put foundation in this is actually the time of year to do it because guess what happens it gets cold if you're like me my shop is not heated it's just a garage I don't want to go out there in January in the freezing cold and do woodwork. First of all, glue doesn't set, all this stuff happens. So I'm out of the temperature parameters to do the work that I should have done this time of year. That's why I'm telling you, go ahead and get your frames together, your supers together, all the stuff that you think you're going to need in spring. And this includes backup hive equipment. So if you want to start nucleus resource hives in spring, start to get those together, get finishes on them and rack them up and get frames in them and have them ready. So when spring hits, which manages to catch people off guard year after year after year, swarms admit they weren't ready. I need to have a swarm, don't have a hive. So this is why I'm telling you because you're listening to me, you're getting this great benefit of advanced preparation. Put together your surplus equipment. You can never have too many frames with drawn comb. Your drawn comb and stuff needs to be protected. What's the number one protection uh, system that I recommend for that? I recommend you put them in hive butlers. If you don't do that, then I recommend that you put industrial strength garbage bags around your stored frames. So if you've got your medium supers out there and all the racks have been cleaned up at your robbing station, now what do you do? You put these trash bags over them so nothing gets in there. And that works. Now, some people leave them open, and I've done that in the past too. Put your box on the floor, put the next one 90 degrees to that one, put the next one 90 degrees to that one, and uh, I had them in the garage like that, open air. Guess what? I finally got pictures of really close up pictures too. Small high beetles. There was pollen in there that the robbing station did not take care of. So, when you've got pollen in the cells for some of the frames that you put on your robbing station and they clean up all the honey. They don't clean out the pollen. That's up to us. So that was my failure. I left old pollen in those frames and I just put the box in the open air in my garage and then I'm looking at it and I'm talking about just a week ago and I'm looking at it and it didn't look right. And I pulled those frames up and what did I see? Small hive beetles and small hive beetle larvae eating pollen. It wasn't enough for them to survive. In other words, the pupa, the larvae, the larvae that came out of that, that should have been able to scoot along the floor and get out and go find their way into the soil. They never left the frames. There wasn't enough there for them. So there was no stored honey. It was just
pollen. But what it provided me with was a great opportunity to photograph small high beetles. So now I have that. But if I had put them in enclosures, so if I'd either put them in hive butlers, I realized for bigger operations, that's not doable because they only hold 10 frames each and you'd have to have a hive butler for each set of 10 frames. If you're a backyard beekeeper, having four or five hive butlers is doable. So that's four or five hives worth of supers. Um, so that works, but also if you don't have that, or if you don't want to buy hive butlers or totes that you can close up and protect them in, trash bags are your next best bet. Um, so that's it. Spring comes fast. Clean up far away from the... That's it for today. So I want to thank you for listening and watching. Please don't forget to check the links and the videos that are down in the video description and uh, check out those videos, Ross Rounds, Comb Honey, links to things like that. And I want to thank you for spending your time with me today. And I hope that you've got the good weather that we do and that you can get your apiary under control before winter sets in. Thanks for listening.